If you're a type 2 diabetic, your doctor will be probably horrified if you're fasting in the month of Ramadan. And so most doctors will advise you not to fast. I'm not here to give medical advice, but I'm also here to tell you maybe we should question some of the advice. In this episode of the Harun Rabbani podcast, I want to explore with you the biggest mistakes that diabetics make during the month of Ramadan, how you can avoid them and start helping yourself to reduce or reverse type 2 diabetes altogether. Now, I'm a health coach and not a medical doctor. None of this is medical advice. Always seek the guidance of your medical doctor before you take any action, particularly in reference to your medication. If you are on serious medication like insulin, lots of metformin, go and see your doctor. Ask them if it's possible for you to fast. If they say no, you're going to have to follow their advice. However, if they say yes, then I'm going to share some tips with you, which will be very useful for you. It's actually useful for you whether you have diabetes or not, by the way. How will the doctor know if you can fast or not? Very simple. You have got your blood sugar under good control. In other words, you are not worsening your condition over a period of time as measured by your doctor. So the 12 biggest mistakes people make starts off with number one, overeating. Fasting itself is absolutely phenomenal. Here's what it does. It reduces the cause, the real cause of insulin resistance, which causes diabetes. It's called hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia is an excess amount of insulin running through your bloodstream, which causes your cells to develop insulin resistance. It's saying, no, I don't want to let you in. And so as a result, you develop type 2 diabetes. When you're fasting for 16, 18, 20 hours of the day, then you are going to produce zero insulin during that time. You may have insulin in your system, but you won't be producing any. So you will end up reducing the amount of insulin in your system. So it's a great way to go. However, there's another consideration. Your body needs energy every single day. I won't say that all men use a certain amount of energy and all women use a less amount of energy. We are all built differently. Some people are taller, some people are shorter. Some people are bigger, some people are skinnier. So it's very difficult to generalize. But let's for one moment, for the sake of an example, explain what I mean. 2,000 calories, let's say, is the amount of energy that you use, your body needs to survive. If you're eating 2,000 calories, you're going to neither gain weight nor lose weight. In the month of Ramadan, you are technically eating less than 2,000 calories. That being the case, you are probably going to lose some weight or maybe even a lot of weight. However, mistake number one is overeating. So you've stayed hungry all day. You've made all the sacrifices. You've had the headaches, especially in the first couple of days, and then you overeat. What was the point of you fasting? It is akin to making all that sacrifice in this very powerful month and then overindulging does not help anybody, especially if you've got type 2 diabetes. So eat in moderation. Remember that there are three parts to eating. Part number one, fill your belly one third with food. Number two, leave one third space available for water. And then number three, leave one third empty. So that the food that you eat is always, always, always in moderation and you will help your diabetes get reversed or reduced big time. Second big mistake, if you've got type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes is going straight after your nemesis, the thing that really hurts your diabetes, which is eating refined carbs like rice, pasta, pizza, donuts, cakes. All of those pastries are damaging to your health. And I'm saying this because, yes, of course, it's logical. It makes sense. But have you any idea how many people, when they're fasting in Ramadan, are eating the most horrible, processed, refined carbs? In fact, I've seen mosques fundraise money for the mosque and charities by selling Krispy Kreme donuts. It it's just totally baffles my mind. So no refined carbs. If you are from a culture where you are used to eating rice, here's a trick that is absolutely powerful, which works. 
The reason we don't want to eat too much rice or any, if at all possible, is it has a glycemic index, which is high. That means you eat it, your blood sugar goes up high very quickly. A low glycemic index produce, carb, means that the blood sugar will only rise slightly, and that's okay. So here's the trick with rice. You cook the rice today. You let it cool down. You put it in the refrigerator, the fridge, and you leave it there overnight for 24 hours. The following day, you can eat it. Following day, it would have reduced its high level of intensity. The glycemic index would have fallen significantly, so it becomes more moderate. So you can have rice, have less, and have it 24 hours later. And it's the same with potatoes, and it's the same with pasta. Pizzas and all that other stuff, forget it, it ain't happening. In the Indian subcontinent where I'm from, we love samosas, onion barges, pakoras, a whole bunch of fried foods that we eat, which actually are not good for you at all. There's a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I don't know the exact numbers at the moment, what the latest science is saying, but over 60% of diabetics have got something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In essence, it's got more fat in the liver than it can handle. What that does is it worsens insulin resistance, which makes you more diabetic. Do your best to avoid those fried foods. If you're going to go anywhere near having those foods, shallow fry them, make sure there's minimal amount of oil. But the best way is to avoid them altogether. The fourth biggest mistake, which horrifies me year in, year out, when I go to Asian weddings and when I'm breaking fast in a group, is the amount of soda or sugary drinks. The colas, the Pepsis, the Fantas, all of these sugary drinks aren't good for anybody anyway, because that is the fastest route to developing type 2 diabetes. If you've got type 2 diabetes, those are the drinks you must avoid, like the plague. Need I say any more? It's liquid sugar. The fifth big mistake that diabetics make is related to something that's close to my heart. It's masala chai, sa, tea, whatever terminology you use. Basically, it's spiced tea. Now, this is something that I grew up with from when I was very young. It's made from a whole bunch of spices, including cinnamon, bay leaf, clove, ginger. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. The traditional way it's made, it's made with dairy milk, cow's milk not water, and people go as far as to add condensed milk and copious amounts of sugar. Three things that are terrible for you as a diabetic. Condensed milk, which is basically sugar, and then sugar itself. You can have your masala chai. I have it regularly whether I'm fasting or not. I have this, and that's using milk such as coconut milk, soya milk, and oat milk. Oat milk's a bit high on the glycemic index, you preferably you don't have it, cashew milk, there's a whole bunch of other milks you can have as an alternative to dairy. And no sugar. The sweetness, the flavors are so amazing anyway. Why would you want to kill it off with sugar? So leave that out. Hyperinsulinemia, like I mentioned, is one of the big underlying causes. That's because we're eating too frequently, meaning every time we put food in our mouth, we have an insulin spike. It might be a small one, it might be a big one, not a big issue. But the average diabetic, even when they're fasting, how many spikes do you think they get? How many times a day that they're eating? Anything between 8 and 15 times. It really varies from person to person. So they've got this constant insulin spike, and this causes hyperinsulinemia. The big mistake people make once they've broken their fast is they'll eat and then they'll eat again and then they'll eat again and they'll snack and nibble throughout the night thinking it's going to be the end of the world because they've been fasting, which is absolutely nuts. But all of that is causing higher and higher hyperinsulinemia. So what do you do? Well, eat during iftar when you break your fast. Eat for sahur and then maybe have one other meal in between at some point earlier on in the evening, but stop the constant snacking. If you're doing Ramadan properly, you haven't got time to go and visit all your families and relatives to have snacks from one house to the other. Stick to the plan, minimize how much you eat, 
and minimize the frequency of eating. Your body is composed primarily of water. When you're fasting, of course, and you're not drinking anything, you're going to get dehydrated. You're going to lose a lot of water. So it is vital that once you've broken your fast, sip water throughout the night. As long as you're awake, sip water. Have herbal teas. If you are going to have coffees, minimize the coffee. It's not such a good idea unless you're staying awake all night to pray, worship, meditate. Unless you're doing that, leave the coffee out. But certainly sip water and herbal teas to keep yourself fully hydrated. And, you know, a very big reason people feel hungry when they're fasting is because they're dehydrated. They haven't had enough water the night before. As a family man, of course, I notice that when I go shopping, the worst time for me to shop is when I'm hungry. My eyes are bigger than my belly. And so this is a mistake a lot of people make in Ramadan. They do shopping on a daily basis. And here's what happens. They go and buy whatever they want to eat during iftar. And they end up getting so much food. And it becomes a marathon of eating, which leads to overeating. So what can you do instead? Number one, plan your meals for the week. You haven't got that many meals, so it's going to be easy to plan. Plan them, do their shopping in one go. And then don't go shopping when you're starving. If you're feeling really, really hungry, don't go shopping. Shop while you're still feeling full of energy and you're not really feeling the hunger. If you've been fasting all day and you've just had some food, there's a high likelihood you might get a sudden blood sugar spike and then you might get a crash. And then what do you want to do when you have a bit of a crash? You want to sleep. Big mistake. If you've got type 2 diabetes, one of the best things you can ever do is this. As soon as you've eaten, no matter what time of night you're going to eat, as soon as you've eaten, go for a 10-minute walk. That 10-minute walk will help reduce insulin spikes. It will use the sugar that's in your bloodstream, take that into your cells, transport it into your cells, use that for the movement, and then make space available for the processing of the newly consumed food to come into your system. In other words, you won't get a blood sugar spike and the crash that goes after it. So as soon as you've eaten, put your shoes on. If it's cold outside, put a warm coat on and go for a walk. Walk for five minutes away from home and then walk back. There's your 10 minutes. Closely related to lack of walking is lack of exercise. Just because you're fasting during the day doesn't mean it's the end of the world. If anything, it is a great opportunity. You see, if you spend your daylight hours sleeping while you're fasting and you spend your nighttime hours awake and eating, all you've done is move your timetable around. Normally you sleep at night and don't eat and you're awake during the day and you will eat. Well, then what was the point of fasting? You're just changing things around. There's no point. There's no spiritual meaning to that. There's no physical meaning to that. So it's very important that you carry on your day-to-day -day activities. I promise you, unless you're in a war-torn area, unless you're in an area where there's huge amounts of poverty and hunger, then you fasting is not the end of the world. In fact, it will give you a clearer mind. It will give you better focus. It will keep you spiritually focused. It'll make you physiologically stronger and healthier. And so during the day, make sure you do your daily activities. And this is what I do is if you can go to the gym, if you can go for a long walk, if you can go for a swim, obviously don't drink anything, don't overexert yourself. But by doing some exercise in the middle of the day, you're going to help reverse your diabetes far more quicker. And final mistake that type 2 diabetics make. And I really hope that this year you make a concerted effort not to make this mistake. It's Indian sweets. Or for the Middle Eastern people, it is baklavas and the likes. Sweets are not good for you if you've got diabetes. Even when fasting's over. Yes, there's a lot of rasmalai, jalabi, all these amazing sweets that are available at your fingertips because everybody's offering that. You need to develop self-respect for your own body. You are a caretaker of your own body. You don't even own your own body. How are you taking care when you're putting sweets into your mouth? So have alternative foods. It's okay for you to have vegetables and fruits. The best fruits for you to have, by the way, are pomegranates, figs, 
dates. If you're going to have dates, majdul dates, then have one or two, maybe three at most. Apples, all the berries, so the strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. If you can avoid the very sweet foods like ripe banana, then that's great. So you can eat most of the fruits. Make sure they're not too sweet or over-ripened. So here are some bonus tips for you to take into consideration to make this year's Ramadan, this year's holy month, a very spectacularly healthy one for you. Number one, plan your meals a week in advance. I've already covered that. Number two, when you eat, chew the food slowly. Chew it many times. I've heard that in hadith, it's been told that you chew it 42 times each bite that you eat. The act of chewing helps with releasing the digestive enzymes. It lets the brain know something's coming through and it helps the brain prepare. And it also means that you digest your food properly. When you break your fast, then don't eat any more than two medjidol dates and the smaller ones, maybe three, four of those and a bit of water and then give yourself a break. Do your salat and then have a protein-rich meal. Now, the protein-rich meal means fish, eggs, lentils, chana, chickpeas. Make sure you add in other elements of macronutrients. So what do you need? Proteins, fats. Fats will come from stuff like avocados, for example, vegetables, and minimize highly starched vegetables such as potatoes. Some of the best vegetables that you can have with your food are the fiber-dense vegetables such as broccoli, kale, spinach, cauliflower, cabbage. If you are going to have any of these foods, like carrots, then make sure you eat them whole. Don't overcook them and eat them raw as possible. Throughout the feeding period, make sure you have plenty of water. Drink herbal teas like Moroccan tea is good for you. Chamomile tea is very calming for you. Valerian tea helps you sleep. So there's a whole bunch of teas you can have which are super healthy for you. If you haven't got type 2 diabetes, you may be tempted to just have one big meal when you've broken your fast and not eat anything. If you've got type 2 diabetes, it is strongly recommended that before Fajr, before your final prayer at Sahur, basically, eat a good quality meal. The best kind of meals that will help you feel full are the protein-rich ones. So don't overeat, but the protein-rich ones will include stuff like egg, fish, chicken, meat, lentils, chana. Speaking of sahur, once you've eaten, do not go to sleep straight away. Go for a short walk. If you're doing fajr, then go and walk as best as you can to the mosque. If, on the other hand, you live far away from the mosque, then drive and park 10 minutes away from the mosque and walk to the mosque. In the middle of the day, you might be feeling tired occasionally. It's okay to have a nap. But if you're going to have a nap, have it earlier on in the afternoon and make it a short nap. A short nap would be 10 to 20 minutes, no longer than half an hour. You don't want to go into 45 minutes or into any kind of deep sleep beyond that because that's going to interfere with your healing process. It's going to interfere with your sleeping patterns later on in the evening. If you're a type 2 diabetic and you've been given the go-ahead by your doctor for you to fast, Always have some kind of sugary snack at hand, some kind of sweet at hand. If you think you've got hypoglycemia and you're about to faint, then it is okay for you to break your fast. Finally, I want to say this. If you've got type 2 diabetes as an adult Muslim, yes, you must fast. However, if you got to the point where you are sick, meaning you are highly dependent on medication, then it is incumbent upon you that you don't fast at all. If you're a female and you are on your period, then you don't fast. If you're a pregnant woman, you don't fast. There are numerous conditions where you don't fast. If you're elderly and you're at the latter stages of your life, I don't know what that is for different people. Some people look elderly when they're in their 70s. Others look like they're elderly when they're into their late 90s. Whatever that means for you, when you're an elderly person, it is not obligatory on you to fast. So... Finally, in case you want to know who I am, my name is Haroon Rabbani. I'm a health coach and I help my private clients reverse type 2 diabetes naturally, permanently, and to get their life back beyond diabetes. If this 
video has been useful for you, then make sure you share as widely as possible to everybody who is going to be fasting this Ramadan. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum.